Maui's new short-term rental property tax. Oh my goodness. Okay, here we are on <clears throat> Tom Yamachika talking tax. Tom Yamachika is president of Tax Foundation of Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we're talking tax with Tom. Um, Morning, Jay. How are you, Tom? Nice. I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show again. Absolutely. So now we're going to talk about Maui. We're taking a short trip over to Maui, to the yes, county council, some, I suppose. Yeah, some t- taxpayers on Maui are getting a nasty surprise this year uh, because they didn't do anything and their real property tax doubled. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, um, uh, or maybe more than doubled. Uh, is, is the is the is the, is what a, a given homeowner pays in Maui more than what a given homeowner pays in Oahu? Well, it depends on what kind of homeowner you are, because um, uh, in Maui there's a three tiered system of uh, uh, owner occupied tax, right? With uh, the rates going from. 251 to 261 per thousand of uh, net taxable valuation, which is about a dollar lower than what we have here in Honolulu. Mm. Okay. But if you uh, are in a second home or renting your unit, there's a, there's a classification called non-owner occupied where the rates go from 545 to $6.90 per thousand. So a uh, little bit more than double the owner occupied rate. Mm-hmm. But there, but there's more. Um, mm-hmm. For short term rentals, the rate is eleven oh eight. Whoa, yep, which is slightly higher than hotel and resort. Wow, and that's it's actually the second highest property tax rate they have on Maui. The highest rate is timeshare at fourteen forty. Mm-hmm. That's that's like. Four or five times what an individual rate would be for a resident a resident um, in the property. No? Yeah, um, it it matters a lot if you uh, own your home and you're living in it. Yeah. Okay, so what happened? Let's talk about how not only how this works, but how it came to pass, so to speak. Okay, uh, what happened was there was a uh, what I call a flash. A uh, change in law. And I'm going to say that because uh, it was a pair of bills uh, known as Bills 129 and 130. They were introduced on November 20th, 2020, passed the council on December 4th, and were signed into law by Mayor Victorino the very next day. So November 20th to December 5th is like two weeks. Uh, is there a reason for a rush? I'm not really sure, uh, but it looks very suspicious. Um, and what that did was it said that if you have a um, uh, a property uh, in a district that doesn't ban um, short-term rentals, then as long as you don't live in it, you'll be taxed as a short-term rental. So previously, if, if they had a long-term rental in there, it would be classified as non-owner occupied. If you, if you lived in there some of the time, it was classified as non-owner occupied. Okay, no more. It now changes from non-owner occupied to short-term rental. And with the effect that the, you know, the person's tax may double or even a little more maybe. Well, it's just an immediate reaction, Tom, is that if I have a piece of geography that doesn't ban short-term rentals, and if um, if I am not living in this property that I own in that geographical area, my tax rate's going to go way up. So, A, this requires me, I mean, as an economic matter, or at least it encourages me, to actually use the place as a short-term rental, even if I would not otherwise do that, even if I would otherwise, for example, do a, a long-term rental. Um, so it, it, it sort of forces me, incentivizes me to bring short-term rentals into my property. 
And the other possibility, the other idea, though, is that... Or you live in there. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm assuming for this discussion that I'm living somewhere else. Okay. Um, the other possibility is that, gee, this is... Uh, if I don't have it rented, but I am charged tax on the assumption that it is rented, I'm really losing money. It's terrible. And so what I do is I get out of there. I sell that property. Yeah, that is the a end, possibility. And in the end, it, let, me, let me just throw this at you. you. You probably analyzed this. At the end, I'm going to wind up with a, with a patch of land, this, this place where short-term rentals are not banned, where everybody is a short-term rental. That this incentivizes short-term rentals. That's that's the back of it. It incentivizes short-term rentals so that that the square I'm describing, the geographical area I'm describing, will all be actively short-term rentals in order to you know respond to this bill that was passed by the Maui County Council. Well, so now now I have a kind of ghetto of short-term rentals. Is, is this is this something you thought about? Well, that, that I think is what the intended. Now, uh, normally in real property tax, when you have zoning, uh, the, uh, the, the tax that applies to your uh, property, uh, you know, short-term rentals or no, is usually based on the highest and best use that's allowed you, you know, in your zoning. So if, for example, uh, you had a watercress farm uh, in a uh, in an industrial area that's you know zoned for strip malls and 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 so forth. You know, I'm thinking like Pearl Ridge. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you are going to be taxed on that area uh, as if it was commercial, same as commercial buildings. You can't get out of um, your property tax classification if your zoning permits a higher and better use. Uh, by by doing something else on your property, that's called highest and best use, uh, the, the concept, and that's familiar to property tax. Well, it's just, it's just uh, something where me, as the owner of the Watercrest Farm, could seek a variance. Um, I'm not sure that would matter, because uh, commercial is allowed allowed by your zoning. And you're, so your tax is commercial. Okay. It doesn't matter yeah, what you do. You're right. I'm thinking about it now. And the variance is to allow for a non-conforming use, uh, a use that is maybe too, too industrial in a residential area, that kind of thing. That would be a variance. But it would not be a variance um, to allow a watercress farm in a shopping center area. That would be backward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, w when you read the the FAQ page at the uh, Real Property Tax Division's office, um, that's that's they just said, hey, you know, we're just doing what everybody else does. We're we're adopting the highest and best use valuation concept, and that's all we're doing. And and you know, everybody's kind of like scratching their heads at that because uh, it's it's kind of um, well, why the heck uh, did, did, did you need all these um, uh, lightning fast uh, you know, change in the ordinance to, to do what, you know, what, what you all were saying was a common thing all along? Okay. Um, and, and, and I think that part of the problem may be uh, fiscal. They don't have money. And they need to raise money. Uh, as you may remember, uh, the um, uh, normally counties get part of their budget uh, from the state in terms of shares of transient accommodations tax, right? Uh, when the pandemic happened, the governor shut off the spigot all the way. No more, uh, no more dollars to the counties. Period. Now that that may have uh, restarted. Uh, I think June first, but uh, but for a very long while, uh, it wasn't happening. And but can you look back? 
can you say, wait a minute, you know, you didn't give us X millions of dollars during the time you shut it off. You just took our money. <clears throat> How about coughing it up? Isn't that possible? Uh, apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the counties never had any entitlement to it. It was it was just something that the legislature gave them. And uh, you know what the legislature giveth can be taken away by the governor. That troubles yep. me. That troubles me. If the legislature gave it and set it up that way, I, I think I suggest to you it was an entitlement. But here we have the entitlement is taken away by somebody who didn't award it in the first place. And it, the, the, the reversal, his action was not by statute. It was just by proclamation. He doesn't have the right to do that, does he? Uh, he says he does under the governor's emergency powers. Uh, and, you know, I had some trouble with understanding why, you know, uh, emergency powers gave him the right to do that. Um, I, you can you can think about it as well. Um, the, the state government needs money, and and they and they kind of make a decision. Well, they can't afford to share this TAT anymore, even though the TAT is not coming in. Uh, so it's probably a moot point anyway. Uh, but but the governor said, okay, well, I can I can shut off all the earmarks, and that's what he did. Effective, I think it was May twenty twenty uh, when that happened. I really think it's a questionable decision. I mean, I know it may be. Uh, you know, Pyrrhic in the sense that um, there was not a lot of TAT anyway, but still, as a as a matter of principle, I don't I don't think he has the power to do that. Emergency well, yeah. power doesn't let you do whatever you want on a given Tuesday. <laughs> well, uh, uh, that that's what we said uh, when it came to like um, shutting off the uh, public records laws, for example, uh, shutting off the. Uh, collective bargaining uh, laws. Uh, you know, we, we we had loudly complained about that because we were kind of getting into an environment where we didn't have laws anymore because all of them were suspended. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, where does it end? Where does it end? Before you know it, you're talking about constitutional rights. Well, the good, you know, the the governor's proclamations, at least up to now, have been, you know, with with a twenty page single space list of laws that are suspended. One and one sentence can, and basically uh, rip up an entire chapter of the HRS. Did anybody take him to court over this? Um, somebody did, and uh, and, and they lost. But but I don't think they were challenging the right provision. Mm. Um, I mean, like for a uh, a provision like the public records laws. Okay, what does this have to do? With us being an emergency, okay. The governor can suspend laws um, to, you know, like streamline operation and and make, uh, you know, alleviate burdens and that kind of thing. But uh, you're you're absolutely right. He doesn't have the right to do anything he darn pleases. Well, um, even the even the suspending of the Freedom of Information Act, as I recall, the argument there was that we don't have enough people to respond to. Freedom of Information Act requests because, uh, you know, our staff can't come in or something along those lines. At the same time, don't you remember there was a, an issue about whether one department, the, uh, the staff of one department could be brought in to do the work of another department, and the union said no, and he went along with that. So it was a, it was a self-created problem. He could have had the staff to respond to the FOIA requests, but took steps to you know, make it impossible. Or well, not, not only that, but he also suspended the collective bargaining law. So, so the union, the union coming in with its argument, you know, they they could have been told, guys, I suspended that law. So you really don't have an argument. You know, it, it just strikes me. I mean, I don't want to put a a value on this, but it strikes me that we did not, legally speaking, we did not do very well through the period of COVID. Would you agree? I would agree. I mean, th there was a lot of, you know, unnecessary reactionary knee jerk, uh, you know, statute suspension. And t to what end, I don't know. Um, it was it was uh, kind of, uh, I, I think, uh, 
part of a you know the, the outcome of a session where the governor asked everybody well you know which 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 laws which laws bother you and they said okay this one and they go okay well, okay, we'll suspend that i'm going we, we, but that's that's not what the emergency power statute is for okay the emergency power statute is so you can respond to an emergency right with emergency steps right so so anyway so it, it sounds like uh, whatever happened at the gubernatorial level uh the county of maui was strapped uh, when, oh, they, yes, they were. when they when they looked at it, um, you know, recently, that December, whatever. Uh, yeah, I mean, December. not only did they have the spigot turned off by the emergency proclamations, but now, uh, with I think it's what Senate uh, House Bill eight sixty four, uh, th there's there's a bill that 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 basically proposes to give the counties the right to impose a surcharge on the TAT, but it basically says we're going to stop sharing permanently. You mean and, in, in violation of the state statute? No, it amends the state statute. Oh, okay, okay. This is in the legislature. Okay. Yeah. So that that's that's one of the bills that's on the governor's desk. Um, uh, a, it would shut off the uh, the spigot to the counties permanently. But B, uh, it would say that they can uh, add their own surcharge to the transient accommodations tax, but without any help. So my guess is that he'll sign that. Why? For the same reason, fiscal fiscal purposes. The state will get more money. Um, the counties will be on their own, but they have the prospect of getting more money too. So well, the, everybody is happy except the taxpayer. Oh, and the counties. The counties are screaming bloody murder. They're screaming bloody murder. Because? Because, you know, it's unlike the, uh, the, the, the GET surcharge. In the GET surcharge, the, the state collects the money, turns it over to the counties, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. This one, there's no help. So the counties have to set up their own uh, tax office to monitor, enforce TAT, uh, the TAT surcharge. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, so... Uh, it'll, cost it, them, it ain't, it'll cost them millions to do that. Yeah, so they need to get staff hired, they need to get staff trained, um, and that's just the start. At okay. the end of the day, you have a redundancy. You do. Um, so, and that's, that's again, a reason why the counties are screaming bloody murder. Yeah. Uh, they, they are you know, stridently in, uh, opposed to this. The hotel industry is opposed to this um, because of, of, of course, the prospect that will we'll, uh, go from, you know, 10 and a quarter percent TAT to 13 and a quarter percent. And that's before the GAT, GET is added on. Mm -hmm. So well, what's interesting, though, is that um, the the TAT issue, and this is it's good that you mentioned this. The TAT issue is is a, it's a tax that the counties have not had the infrastructure, the apparatus to collect, right right now right. up till now. But the real property tax, which is this strange bill you mentioned in the, in Maui, the real property tax has the infrastructure. It's, right. it's you know, already the counties, systematized. Yeah, yeah the, the counties of, didn't have it from the beginning, of course. Um, uh, but but they wanted the independence. They they lobbied the you know the 78 con con to give them that and the and the and the con con gave them that. And so you know right they, now they, today they have the ability to collect tax themselves. And if it's a matter of interpretation or rate they can do that within the existing infrastructure, right? Right. It's not hard. And, and, then, and then there's a second issue. And the second issue is that um, apparently, according to the county auditor's report, uh, a number of the hotels came to the administration and said, my God, our business is going through the floor. Can you give us a break on valuation? And they did. It, it, so, so it actually went down? The valuations went down. Yes. How do you how do you do that by by county a, county action? Yeah, you convince the appraisers that the the value of X Y Z hotel uh, isn't as uh, uh, is isn't as high as it was the previous year. Which um, and and there's a credible argument for that because there's no tourists coming. So right. how can you how can you you know make it as a hotel? <laughs> but wait wait a minute. I mean, this is this is not a matter of county council action it's not no. a matter of the mayor 
It's just a matter of talking story in the back room kind of thing. Can you well, I mean, get the, your the, assessors to give the, us the, a lower The mayor rate? may have approved it. As the, the mayor is in charge of the assessing agency, so he probably would have had something to do that. So, so I mean, is it a, I mean, how much transparency is this? So is, is it a memo? Is it a proclamation? No, none, none of the foregoing. None of the foregoing. Just talk story, that's all. Yeah. And then uh, apparently it bothered the county auditor enough, so he wrote about it. Uh, and that's kind of where I'm getting that information from. So, so there was, there was you know, um, some devaluation of the hotels done by administrative fiat. Okay. And, and, my, and my question is, well, who else got the opportunity to, to come down and um, you know, talk story with the appraiser and say, well, geez, you know, uh, we got no tourists coming, so uh, my, my property value is you know, a whole bunch less. Yeah, what about a homeowner who lost his job? Yeah. I'm troubled by this. This it actually sounds what's, that Cyrus Vance would be interested. <laughs> hey, maybe. <laughs> but that's 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 what happened. Uh, we're we're talking here about um, this is this is what happened. Uh, very little of it, I think, hit the press. So we're, that's why we're talking about it here today. Mm -hmm. Well, that there's a, that's an underlying question here. You know, you have this uh, talk story thing about lower valuations, which is, it really sounds like Trump. Um, and, um, and then you, without, without any transparency, without any public announcement, even with the concern, to the concern of the state auditor. Um, and, and then you have this strange bill that pops up from nowhere, which essentially increases, um, yeah, increases the individual taxation. Of, of a person who has a, um, you know, a rent, a short-term rental property in a given zone. I mean, it, it sounds terribly unfair. And what makes it even more unfair, I think, is that, you know, this short, this, this short notice bill, the quickie bill, nobody explained. Did anybody try to explain? Did anybody ask for an explanation? Uh, I didn't. I didn't see one. I mean, it may have gone through so quickly that that nobody uh, had the chance to, and, and that's one of one of my concerns. I mean, how can you have uh, appropriate public notice and input when you know start to finish is two weeks? I mean, that's very hard. The the the, the decision to you know go forward with the bill, sign it, um, you know, that must have been done way before the the bill was ever introduced. I thought I, I think they thought they were being clever though. Because you know, there's an enforcement problem with short-term rentals. How how are you gonna know that to taxpayer A, real property owner A, who lives out of out of the the district, the ghetto, so to speak, um, is is involved in a short-term rental? Is there a reporting requirement or can he just do it and not say boo about it? Um, this way. Arguably, the county doesn't have to get into that enforcement issue. If you own it and you don't live there, then you 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 must be using it, uh, or you could or should use it um, as a short term rental. Yep, um, that's. So would you makes... would you oppose that on a you know assuming it wasn't a surprise bill like this? Would you would you agree that that's a legitimate reason? Yeah, it does simplify enforcement. That's what it does. Um, yeah. but, but, but then, then again, you know, you have to kind of, uh, hear what the stakeholders have to say. Uh, mm -hmm. you need to con you know, consider the equities, balance the values, uh, no indication that any of that was ever done. Yeah. Well, desperate times, uh, result in desperate measures, don't you think? And the question I put to you in a larger sense, Tom, is, are we in desperate times? Ah, uh, well, I think it it it's in the in the eye of the beholder, um, but I think some people do think we're in desperate times, and that's that's why we're coming into, you know, doing stuff like this. Um, I I you know personally think that yeah we had a we had a you know bad uh, catch 
and we're kind of getting over it. But uh, you know, does that require uh, like the wholesale suspension of laws? I don't think so. Uh, what 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 really troubles me about it is that when you have this, uh, you know, suspension uh, slash emergency uh, emergency milieu. Um, agencies kind of pick and choose what they're following and what they're not. And and there's room for a very lot of, you know, a, a whole lot of arbitrariness. Are we a government of laws for, of men? Uh, apparently, uh, until, until we get into desperate times, then we're not. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, 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 the just the focusing on this uh, Maui County, you know, short-term rental, tax bill. Uh, what, what troubles me is, is the notion that Maui County finds itself in desperate straits. And certainly the state is in desperate straits. But the state has this um, you know, preemptive, preemptive power. Um, and it did promise and agree and create an entitlement for the counties and then decided, the governor by himself, decided that it was not going to follow through on that because we were in desperate times. What troubles me about it, Tom, and I'd really be interested in your opinion, is who's to say the counties are not in desperate times? Uh, is the state more important than the counties? The state is saying, your problem, boys, we're not going to help you out. We don't care what happens to you. We're cutting your funding. Go find a way. And yeah, that's and very troublesome. It is very troublesome. I, I you know, personally thought that, uh, you know, one or one or more of the counties would have gone to court and said, you know, come on, guys, this is not an appropriate use of the governor's emergency power. You know, what? Where is the connection to, uh, you know, the the emergency? I mean, this is this is just a money grab. That's all it is. It's what it is, and it sounds to me like ultra virus. Because because there was an entitlement, and because there's no good reason to cut it off, you so you just keep the money. Why are you keeping the money? Because I can. That's why I'm keeping the money. So sue me. That sort of thing. I I, I really think but nobody did. Man, yeah, but nobody, nobody did. did. Nobody mm -hmm. did. So we we are, we're all in you know deer in the headlights, not knowing what to do. And and I like to I like to ask you this other larger question is. Have we learned anything? I don't think so. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't look like it. With, uh, for example, the current state of the um, uh, public records laws, uh, we're kind of back to where we were in the 1950s, where nobody was really following anything, and and and, and agencies were, were 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 saying, "Oh yeah, I know. Thank you for coming in the door," and then and then just kind of like, uh, you know. Crumpling the the request and throwing it in the trash can. Well, you know, in my practice experience, if you wanted information from the state, um, yes, there was a statute that allowed freedom of information and put an obligation on state agencies to respond, but they never did. And when you caught them off, you know, off the record, they would say, "The only way you're going to get this is sue us." So even for the most modest freedom of information act request. A lot of people had to go to court and sue them. That's expensive and time consuming and unproductive, really, for everyone, including yeah. especially the taxpayer. So yeah, a couple of years ago, the foundation got involved in a case uh, where it involved like revenue estimates. Um, uh, the the uh, the requester had gone to the Office of Information Practices and said, "Hey, this is public information." Office of Information Practices agreed, and they wrote an opinion saying, you know, go, go disclose this. And then and the Department of Tax appealed it to circuit court. They said, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We don't, we don't think you're right. Uh, we, we, they, they lost the appeal. Wasting everybody's time. So the other thing, you know, that comes out of all of this is, okay, so we had emergency proclamations left and right, not one, but a series, not one, you know, area of uh, law, 
in the state, but many areas of law, some really questionable as to whether they were uh, the appropriate subject of emergency. So now it is, it is now, and you can quote me on this, it is now June of, um, of 2021, long after these proclamations began. Have any of these proclamations been reversed? And if so, which? And if so, why those, not the others? And are there any left standing? Well, the, the way the proclamations worked is uh, each one kind of built up, built up on the last. So uh, everything in like the first, you know, the first five were amended and restated in, in number six. Everything in the first six were amended and restated in number seven and so forth. So we're up to, I think, 20 now. Uh, we keep going. It's like the ever ready battery. We keep going and it's now June of 2021 and it's a year and a half at least after this all began. And are we, are we still repeating the earlier ones or are we? Yes, we're repeating the earlier ones. So we're not, we're not excluding them simply for the passage of time. We're not, we're not saying, okay, this is not an emergency anymore as to that particular area of law. We're saying it's all still an emergency, suffer. Right. Exactly. That's wrong, isn't it? I think it's wrong. Yeah. We want to reopen everything, we want to get back to normal. And yet uh, the state doesn't see this as normal at all. They still see it as a, a burgeoning emergency legally. Yep. And uh, they, they do that because emergency proclamations have a, a limited life. So I think it's 60 days. So on the 59th day, they come up with an emergency proclamation saying, well, we're still in an emergency, so here's, here's what it is. We'll amend and restate everything that's come before uh, for another 60 days. And, they, and, you, and, you, and you kind of daisy chain it uh, you know, down the path. So you're in a state of emergency for a year and a half or more. Well, it wasn't clear at the outset. I remember you and I talked about it back when, about whether you could do that, whether you could daisy chain this way. Because the law says, you get 60 days to do your thing with emergencies. <laughs> and what the administration here has done is it has taken that and made it into not 60 days, but a year and a half. Um, I don't know if that's what the legislature intended, but let me ask you this question. If we were going to reform this area, if we're going to make this, this kind of thing impossible, uh, would any particular legislative action be helpful? Or are you saying rather that we have to go individually to court on anything we feel that's overreaching? Well, you know, in this past legislature, there was, uh, I believe, a bill uh, that was aimed at, um, you know, reforming this daisy, daisy chain practice. Uh, it passed conference committee. Uh, it, was, it was all set to go up to the governor. Uh, and then lo and behold, uh, the House on the very last day switched its position and said, okay, we're going to recommit this. So everything everything falls to the ground. And no transparency on that. Yeah, we don't know why that happened. Yeah. Well, Tom, it's always a pleasure. I always, uh, after our discussions, I always sort of need to soak my head a little, but that's just me. Uh, <laughs> and of course, I, I look forward to the next show and the next set of multiple com complex compound uh, revelations. Thank you, Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Thanks, T. Aloha.